it's just perfect that finally the world has woken up to us. Luxurious fabrics, hand-woven splendor, India's traditional craftsmanship is prized worldwide. The West is looking to the booming market of the world's most populous country. We want to know, why are Indian designers attracting so much attention? What do they have to offer? What drives them? And what does India's Generation Z wear? Come with us on a journey from Mumbai via Delhi to Chennai and to Paris, where an Indian designer has made it to the pinnacle of haute couture. The real luxury can be found in things which are created by hand. And India can be a power center of creating luxury because India has got maximum hands in the world today. Fashion from India, from saris to sneakers. The north of India, at the gates of Viranasi. The holy city on the Ganges, said to be more than 3,000 years old, is considered the spiritual center of the subcontinent. Viranasi has many names. It's also known as Binaris, Kashi, or the city of light. This city is sacred to Hindus, and the Buddha is said to have delivered his first teachings here. Along with Hindus and Buddhists, Muslims, Sikhs and other religious groups also live here. Here we meet Himang Akrival. The designer knows the city of Varanasi well because he was born and raised here. Locally we have a saying in Hindi, which is Chana Chabaina Ganga Jal, Jo Kurve Kartar, Kashi Kabahuna Chodiye Vishwanath Darbar, which loosely translates to that if you give me a handful of grams to munch, you know, uh, and a place to stay. I would never leave Kashi because Banaras because this is the eternal city of Shiva, of Vishwanath. So, uh, so yes, you can leave one. You can take a man out of Kashi, but you cannot take a Kashi out of a man. Akreval left his city once to study at the renowned fashion design school NIFT or NIFT in Mumbai. His designs, under his own eponymous label, are influenced by the traditions of his hometown Varanasi. Precious hand-woven fabrics, woven with centuries-old techniques that use real silver threads, called zeri. Not long after completing his studies, Agrival returned to Varanasi. This is the most traditional, most myth-enshrouded city in all of India. It's also a surprising city, full of contradictions and synchronicity. Around 1.2 million people live here. Most Indians try to make a pilgrimage here once in their lifetimes. Hindus believe that bathing at the steppe-like riverbank fortifications, the Ghats, is especially desirable, as bathing in the holy river Ganges is believed to purify one from sin. Each evening, hundreds gather along the Ganges, both believers and tourists, for the Ganga Arati, a sacred ritual of light and sacrifice. Hindus often come here to spend the last days of their lives, According to Hindu mythology, dying and being cremated in Varanasi is a way out of the constant cycle of death and rebirth. From here, Himang Agrawal sells his precious fabrics to customers all over India. I have been a textile maker for 20 years and I've been I've been blessed to work with some of the greatest names in design coming from Japan, coming from continental Europe including France, including Germany. Agrawal joined the family textile business that his father founded in 1974. Banarasi silk saris. The saris from Banarasi have been known throughout India for centuries. The celebrated art of the local weavers first became famous during the Mughal period when Muslims ruled India back in the 16th century. Earlier, the ladies used to mostly stay at home. 
Whereas today the ladies go out working, and there is some difficulty in wearing a Banarasi sari while commuting. So they switched to Western clothes, but personally, I like the sari. Even today, the sari looks the best at any festival, wedding or special occasion. In my opinion, there is a lot of grace in wearing a sari. Within the industry, Agraval has a reputation for preserving the old weaving traditions from Varanasi. These precious saris are worn at weddings and festivals. Hi, we are Suta. Come, Come on, on in. A different city and a completely different vibe. We meet two sisters from Kolkata who run their business from Mumbai. The sisters are passionate about wearing saris and think it would be a shame to only wear the traditional attire at festivities. Oh, I love this. That's how I love mi mixing and matching. This is my absolute favorite. Uh, oh, they have yeah. fallen in love with the sari anew. Their reinterpretation has turned it into a success story. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> our mother, our aunts, our grandparents, they all wore saris so easily and in the day-to-day -day lives. They would sleep in a sari, they would wake up, work, um, get uh, dressed, freshen up and then again wear a sari. So sari felt like home. I would come back home, hug my ma, and it felt like, oh, this is home. And that's how saris always were in our heads. And uh, saris always become the person who's wearing it. Uh, whatever shape it is, whatever mood you are in, sari wraps you like that. You know, that was the essence of the sari in our hearts. The headquarters in Mumbai are the heart of the operation and the first port of call for in-house customers. From here, they also ship all over India. Today, Suta is known throughout the subcontinent, but the company started out very small. We moved to this very narrow lane. It was a masjid gali. There's literally cars couldn't wouldn't come in. The vegetable and carts yeah, are, are usually there. There was a garage shutter, and there were mostly like cows and goats outside. We would pick up the shutter. There was like a tiny room, and we would go in and start working. And that was our first office, and we painted it beautifully inside. It inside, if you just enter, it would be like oh, magical wow, <laughs> space because the walls were painted by ours. Things were stacked on the floor on a on a bed sheet, and it was stacked <laughs> up there. It was it was just a magic room, you know. The sisters' esprit is part of their secret to success. Almost weekly, they post sensual, feminine, imaginative videos to their Instagram account, showing the pair in new sari combinations, enjoying themselves. Suta caters to the desires of its young clientele. For instance, for Halloween, just one of their many ideas. Back to Varanasi, where it's mostly traditional saris that are traded. Varanasi is one of the most important centers of the Indian textile industry. Here they specialize in hand-woven fine fabrics. The precious Banarasi saris are coveted throughout India. They're sold all over the city and woven behind almost every door. Hemang Agraval and his family have remodeled a 250-year-old palace and opened it as a showroom for his luxury textile label Anjora, with a prestigious view of the Ganges. Here, Hemang Agraval welcomes customers from all over India. We wanted Anjora, the label, to signify about the best of traditional weaving as has happened over the last two centuries or more. In our other labels, we also do a lot of uh, tweaking with making it contemporary. Anjora purely talks about uh, how weaving has been practiced over the centuries and how the same form still continues and the same things are still re relevant. Centuries old traditions and weaving practices, that's what his label stands for. Agraval is very conscious of tradition, something that made the move from textile trade to design even harder for him. Creating something new with the tradition-rich fabrics was almost a sacrilege, but he took the leap. In 2016, Agraval showcased his collection for the first time at India's biggest fashion event, the Lakme Fashion Week. He's been a regular guest ever since. So the sensibility was to make it appeal to a wider audience. 
Indian as well as international. So uh, it, that has been the center of our uh, ideology that we consciously want to create something different uh, using the same set. You know, as I always say that the soul of the craft can remain the same, but the body can take different shapes and different forms. Back to Mumbai. Sari trade is a philosophy for the creators of Suta. It's not just a commodity, it's not just a product. It is more than that, it's an extension because Sari itself is a, such a thing that you'll fall in love. And then also as a brand, we want inclusivity, we want the love, the honesty to spread. And I think that's doing its job that people are showing, sharing so much love on us. Their mission is to make the sari wearable again, beyond festive occasions. But many of their young customers are unsure how to even wrap a sari. There are different ways, depending on the region and social status of the wearer. The designers skillfully use social media to get their message across, posting almost daily. They even have a pre-draped sari in their collection and offer tutorials. We had to show that sari is like a t-shirt, you know. I would wear shoes with it, um, I would wear a t-shirt underneath some days, I would just wrap the sari, the short sari for cycling. We did a cycling thing and we wore short saris, all of us, all the girls, with short saris were cycling all over Bombay. So we did all of that to remind people that saris used to be that, you know. Our ancestors wore saris and did everything, hunting, running, everything in saris, you know. There was no uh, tailor then, back then, right? Everything happened in a sari. The duo have opened 17 shops across India. They even get fan mail from men who have discovered the unstitched, sometimes nine meter long garment for themselves. Saris as a signifier of a self-confident generation that plays with gender roles. A bride and groom wearing traditional attire should ideally look something like this. India's most famous Bollywood stars. Aliyah Pat and Ranveer Singh wearing the finest festive attire at star designer Manish Mahutra's bridal fashion show. Buying precious garments like these is a dream many wealthy Indians are happy to shell out for. Weddings in India are a huge business. Most weddings last for several days with some 500 guests on average. Celebrations take place at multiple locations and involve many rituals, together with family, friends, neighbors, and the entire village. Many families spend a fortune. Precious silk saris are popular, embroidered with real gold and silver, like the famous Kanchipuram saris. We're in South India. RMKV is one of the largest and most renowned high-quality sari providers in Chennai, formerly known as Madras. The company has been in operation since 1924. I'm here with all the elders in my family, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles and everyone. And we're really thrilled today to be here. Sari shopping itself is a, such a vibrant experience with the flooding of colors, everything. It makes us... It's such an emotion and we're so happy. If you look at my wardrobe, I have something around 200 plus saris. I haven't worn everything yet. I have a wide variety of saris. Saris in our culture are like a part of the body, right? Saris can be seen at all celebrations, from the Tamil ear piercing ceremony to the wedding ceremony. A lot of Western clothes and trends may come and go, but nothing is complete without a sari. Saris are great for women, and that's especially true of a Kanchipuran silk sari. In particular, they really enhance a woman's beauty and elegance. A Kanchipuran sari is the highlight of our Tamil wedding. It's an auspicious occasion when the bride and groom come to choose a bridal sari. It's a very special moment. The bride is given up to 51 precious saris for the wedding from just one side of the family. The cost of each sari starts at 150 euros and can go into the tens of thousands. Far away from India, the country's textile splendor is also captivating fashionistas in Europe. Glittering luxury, seductive haute couture fantasies, a sea of glistening sequins, that's the world of star designer Rahul Mishra, the first Indian designer to have made it to the Paris haute couture week. So dreams are beautiful. Dreams are dreams 
are driving the country like India and it's a country of I would say billion dreams. Mishra has brought India to Paris. Only the very best are allowed to showcase their creations here during the biannual Haute Couture Week. The event is the crowning glory of the fashion cosmos. Preparations for his latest show are in full swing. The team has been working for six months. The models are from Paris. The team is from India. Nerves are on edge. Just sew it along the line and then it will be perfect. Yeah, brown was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it looks like he has got half an inch longer things. See this? Half an inch longer, half an inch longer here. So maybe if you if you give him, might we be, can switch. Yeah, we okay, can we'll switch. And okay. and let me just see if I can open. Yeah, I have got a little margin here. I can I can make this longer. No problem. When it comes to haute couture, each show must be perfectly planned and staged. The world's press is watching, and Mishra hopes to represent India in the best possible light. I was born in a very, very small village in India, so my first ten years were almost away from the entire world, just restricted to the village. That was my entire universe. And beyond that, it used to be like uh, at night, sleeping under the stars, enjoying that time was really, really beautiful. So, and then hearing stories from my grandmother, playing with her, with her spinning wheel. Although as a child, you know, I had no idea it's forming an, an impact onto me. You know, I'm just like, I'm just playing, just for fun of it. But then, when I'm today designer, when I look back, I'm able to connect dots. Like how, how that, that time shaped my thinking. Back in India, for millennia, women in South Asia have draped themselves in silk and linen. The wearer's origins can be identified by how she wears the garments, as well as the type of fabric, its colors, and embroidery. The first mention of saris can be found in a Hindu hymn book from around 3000 BC. In Sanskrit, the word means a strip of fabric. India has 28 states and more than 100 ways to drape a sari. In 2023, the sari even made it into an international museum. The London Museum of Design paid homage to sari design with 60 different exhibits. As a festive garment, the sari is in, but for everyday wear, it hasn't always been. In 2015, two friends from Bangalore grew tired of the hundreds of saris just sitting in their closets, so they founded a movement under the hashtag 100 Sari Pact. It called on women to make a conscious decision to wear their saris in everyday life. The movement captivated the country. But what does the younger generation think about tradition and modernity? Is there still room for up to nine meters of tradition-rich fabric between Instagram and YouTube? I don't look like a teacher, but when I go to school, I wear sari, that defines my fashion, my profession. I'm a dancer as well, so when I started dancing, I was very baggy pants and all, because I was into hip-hop. Then I realized that I'm more into a dance form, which is popping, so I changed my style. Like It came like a, a woman in suit fashion. Is like I change it by time to time, like how I feel according to my emotions, according to my energies, like what I want to. As for my generation, we're not expected to dress uh, traditionally in suits or saris every single day. We can wear modern clothes, we can wear western clothes. But I would say that my mother and grandmother, they're so blessed that they came from very open families who loved their expressions of themselves. Like for now, I'm wearing my grandmother's belt, actually. And it's just, yeah, it depends on every household in India. Yeah. I like to dress very androgynously. So for a person like me, expressing who I am, I use the way I dress to, you know, just communicate what I feel as a person and what my, you know, gender identity is and who I am. Back to Europe, to Paris, to the fashion world of Rahul Mishra. Fashion is both art and business, a sculpture as a piece of clothing. The show is the latest test at Haute Couture Week. Black 
you have got best of the brands from almost all the countries they come and showcase here so be among being amongst them seeing their work and at the same time improving your game yeah it's like uh, there's a beautiful saying if you want to be the best player play with best teams so you know that's what paris has done to us in the last 10 years of time and we are learning opulently embroidered designs often with indian narrative elements is how mishra made a name for himself in the industry his master embroiderer afsil zarivala is with him he's worked with mishra since 2010 is all credited to him because his workmanship was so beautiful that it kind of made me realize that hand embroidery is a beautiful craft it has got so much of goodwill so many good things attached to it Mishra knows just how important the craftsmanship of his employees is it's what got him where he is today He greatly values their time-honored cross-generational knowledge. This is an art. In my village, some learn this and some also do gold work. It helps us earn a living. Have you been doing this long? Yes, I've been doing it for 42 years. We have got these threads also to finish them a bit better. And uh, we'll just put a, uh, come, come with me. After his last Paris Haute Couture week, Mishra read about and India so surpassing so China in population so and got the idea for his current collection. He called it We the People, a tribute to his team. The new collection features designs based on portraits of his artisans. Yeah. very very important they're like family we wanted to do something um, like a tribute to our carigars to uh, the people who work for us so in each petal we created uh, people working in it it's a very gandhian thought behind the whole idea is like we are in fashion business we have to create clothes what if if we can slow down the process of creation so that more people can participate in the process of making clothes and that is what makes haute couture far more beautiful far more valuable far more divine they have just one day left to make their dream come true of another successful haute couture week From the luxury bubble back to India to the dark side of the fashion industry, fast fashion. It's an industry that spits out cheap clothes at an ever increasing rate. Much of the clothing will only be worn a few times. Quality doesn't matter. In India, nearly 8 million tons of textile waste are generated every year. With global clothing production doubling in the past 15 years, it's a serious problem. It's estimated that the fashion industry uses around 93 billion cubic meters of water annually. Around the same amount of water 5 million people drink in a year. The countryside in the state of Tamil Nadu in the middle of the southeast of the subcontinent. Here we meet a designer who like many young Indian designers has taken up the sustainability cause. And I'll be very happy about it if if my journey makes at least a, an inch of difference among the people. A village on the outskirts of the South Indian city of Chennai. This is where Venu Supraja finds inspiration for her fashion. She grew up just 10 kilometers from the village of Purisai. I think it's my duty to bring out all these hidden gems from my background to the world's eye so that they get noticed and uh, the art form gets the limelight that it deserves to get. As a fashion designer, Supraja wants to let her childhood memories inspire her. Her current collection was influenced by the street theater known as Terukutu that is still alive in the village today. Terukutu is a form of storytelling and uh, and it's a very very ancient art form. 
it happens throughout the night and they narrate stories like mahabharatam episodes of mahabharat or episodes of ramayan and uh, several other short stories that we have heard growing up and it's very crude it's very raw rustic very colorful and very inspiring too Drawing on the strong lines, the stripes of the large skirts and the tassels, Supraja created her collection. Her label has been around since 2015. Supraja has made a name for herself in the industry as a designer who works very sustainably. It's important to her that the sustainability concept runs right through to the very last link in the supply chain. I also make sure that I source all the all the raw materials and all the fabrics and every single element of my garments from from the local community and uh, I try to engage uh, local artisans in making the garments and making the accessories so it's more you know I would say it's not just grounded superficially it is grounded and rooted in every true sense Vinu Supraja has even written a book about the polluting nature of the fast fashion industry. We can't just pollute this world for the sake of wearing new clothes every day and leave back a very dirty world, very polluted world to our children, right? There is no point in building bank balance and uh, buying houses for our children and not giving them clear air, clean air and clean water, right? So at least for that sake, we need to be more conscious about what we buy. In September 2023, she presented her Puri Sai collection at Fashion Week in London, complete with a dance interlude. Being a sustainable fashion designer is not easy at all because we are talking about selling a philosophy, not selling a product. We are asking people to become more minimal. We are we are asking people to be more conscious about their buying cho choices and we are also selling garments right so it's kind of you know you come to a middle ground it's more about preaching than about making profit back in the traditional city of varanasi making a genuine banarasi sari from silk is a feat in itself hemang agrawal shows us another label in his family's textile empire Holy Weaves, a business run by his brother. The Akravas work together with up to 2000 weaving families. The weavers need anywhere from a few weeks to 6 months to complete a single piece, even longer if the design is complicated. The Akravas value the craftsmanship of their workers, having worked with many of the families for generations. My fathers and forefathers have all been involved with this craft. Now we have only older weavers left, hardly any young weavers. They have mostly gone over to power looms. Very few left in hand looming. What comes out of the hand loom can never come out of a power loom. That is not possible. There's simply no comparison to hand loom weaving. The weavers of Hemang Agrawal are well paid. They're valued for their high quality artistic work and make a good living from it. Nowadays though, manual work is on the decline. Three quarters of Banasari saris are produced by machine. The saris are cheaper to make and the weavers don't earn as much for them as they did in the past. 120,000 weavers live in Varanasi. Most of them are Muslim and live in poor weaving colonies, earning less than a construction worker does in a day. Many work on power looms, which produce saris and fabrics much more cheaply, up to one or two a day. Most of us are involved with machine weaving, but even with machine work, the business is not going well. The trade is bad. That's why a lot of people are leaving and going elsewhere. Some are finding other jobs too. There are a lot of power cuts here. That affects us weavers a lot. It's really tough. We can hardly get by. 
वो अभी जैसे वी कैन बाई फूड विथ वट वी अर्न उनका कोई But we were poor before, and even today we are poor. There is no progress. Sometimes even just living can be tough. Hand blooms are becoming increasingly rare, with many younger people here simply no longer willing to do the hard, laborious work. Like most other places in the world, craftsmanship is still highly valued, but it is often replaced with technology. Technological advancements have changed India before. In 1918, India was under British rule. The colonial power Britain flooded the Indian market with cheap machine-made fabrics from Europe. This prompted Mahatma Gandhi to act. India grew hundreds of tons of cotton annually, and yet Indians were unemployed half the year. Instead of sending their raw cotton to English mills, why not make their own cloth? Thus began the Khadi or homespun movement. The Khadi movement was an aid program for the poor in Indian villages. Spinning and weaving became part of an ideology in India for independence and self-governance. Each village was to grow and harvest its own raw materials for yarn, and each village should weave what it needed for its own use. The independence movement adopted Gandhi's principles of non-violent action and civil disobedience, ultimately leading to the end of British colonial rule in the country. In 1947, India declared its independence as a state. To this day, Gandhi is considered the father of the nation, with the spinning wheel at the center of the Indian flag. Even the current government under Prime Minister Narendra Modi promotes Khadi. Politicians, including Modi himself, wear khadi vests at public events. Today, the fabric is produced by small and medium-sized enterprises. Khadi is part of India's national identity, the thread that brought India independence. Government-run khadi stores can be found throughout the country, and khadi is back in vogue. On our way to New Delhi, the capital of India, in the north of the subcontinent, 1.4 billion people are governed from here. Since April 2023, India has been the most populous country in the world, and its economy is growing at a rapid pace. In New Delhi, the seat of the Indian government, the parliament, and the highest courts, President Modi is omnipresent. His image adorns every bus stop. Narendra Modi is everywhere. Since becoming prime minister in 2014, Modi has placed significant emphasis on his public image. His style reflects the fact that India's clothing and fabrics are part of the country's national heritage. He is often seen wearing a vest, a sleeveless jacket worn by many politicians before him, now called the Modi jacket by many Indians. Under Modi's government, there are more and more initiatives to support India's textile industry and to promote global marketing with designers. A residential district on the outskirts of Delhi. This is the house of designer Ritu Berry, who's granted us a private audience. The setup of her opulent abode is something of a calling card for Berry's cosmopolitan style. This is a very old altar which I got from uh, Goa. It's from an old church. She's been involved in the fashion industry for 30 years. The whole thing is hand painted, and uh, there's embroidery as well. Uh, it's an African inspired. I do believe that life is short, and you've got to live your life to the fullest and enjoy as much as you can. So. Everything, every object in my house has a story to tell, and I mix different cultures together. There's no set thing, you know, and I'm, I, I like to break molds. Her hallmark is an elegant, opulent mix of styles with influences from all corners of the globe. She's considered the Indian queen of fashion. The Indian government has even minted a postage stamp in her honor. In 1989, Barry was the first graduate of a newly founded fashion design institute in Delhi. Her label has been around since 1990.
She was also the first Indian designer to show a collection in Paris at a time when India was still not recognized as a design center. In 1999, Barry gave the French fashion world an insight into mystical India. What I presented in my first show was completely Indian. There was, there was no Western element. It was all about what India stands for. I had Indian uh, dresses. In fact, I had uh, my models, um, you know, bare feet with Indian, uh, you know, the, the red uh, foot uh, uh, paint. So it was all very, very Indian and people loved uh, this introduction to Indian culture, which I, which I was very pleased with. In 2000, Barry became the first Asian woman to head a French fashion house. She designed the Pret-à-Porter collections at fashion house Jean-Louis Scherrer. She was very interested in how Western patterns were created and invited Western teachers to India to teach Indian tailors. As a designer, she blends Indian and Western style elements. In 2010, the French government conferred on her the knight's honor, l'Ordre Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres. There followed accolades from the Spanish royal house as well as many others. It was a tough journey because I had to break that barrier, I had to prove myself. I had to prove myself that Indians are capable of going beyond just copying and, and doing things, you know. And, and so, but, it, but having said that, I have to say that uh, I, I loved my journey and given a second chance, I would do it yet the same way, you know. In her homeland, Ritu Berry is seen as a design icon a Donatella Versace of India. She may have peaked in the 1990s, but her influence still holds. She ensures that the Indian fashion industry is globally recognized. India's fashion design scene is still relatively young and needs to develop, she says, but it has potential. Barry dresses celebrities and politicians for Indian state visits. With Britain's King Charles and former President George W. Bush among her clients, since 2015, she's been officially appointed by the Indian government as the ambassador for Khadi, the hand-woven fabric once promoted by Gandhi himself. About six years ago, Khadi was considered a fabric for either senior citizens or politicians. So it was not, you know, it was not a very popular fabric and not a very trendy fabric. But also I must give credit to our honorable prime minister who, who did a lot to promote Khadi to the to the world and, and to India. Fashion is not just clothes, it's, it's the image of the country. Back to Europe, to Paris, to Rahul Mishra. He couldn't have realized his dream without teamwork, including the support of his wife. They founded the label together in 2013. The couple met during their design studies. We have seen things in very micro levels. We have troubleshooted a lot of things. We learned a lot. There were many slips, there were many turns, there were many difficult stops. But that's how you learn. You know, you learn from where you started from the very smallest of micro details. And that's how we have been able to pull together the brand. And God's been kind. Now, even India's celebrities and influencers fly to Paris for Mishra's show. It's sort of a great, creative, um, you know, booming, flourishing period where anything is possible and where everyone is interested and where each moment, each new look that's created is sort of writing the Indian history and the evolution of Indian fashion and how we take it on a global stage. His eighth appearance at the Haute Couture Week is to take place at the Musée de la Monnaie in the courtyard of the prestigious Money Museum. The tension is palpable. Mishra's journey took him on a scholarship via Milan to Paris. He won the highly respected Woolmark Prize, like Yves Saint Laurent and Karl Lagerfeld before him. This paved the way for Rahul Mishra to arrive at the heart of the international fashion scene. He had his first show in Paris in 2014 with a ready-to-wear collection. Then came the leap to haute couture. 
The who's who of international fashion is here. Those with tickets are hand-picked and include influential Indian celebrities, fashion bloggers and international industry players. Even Susie Menkes is here, the undisputed British icon of fashion criticism who gave her verdict on Mishra's work early on. I've always loved India and been interested in what can be done there. And the work of human hands is especially rewarding. And Rahul Mishra himself is someone who believes so strongly in using hands, in making things beautiful, but naturally. He took so many people in India and taught them how to create things to wear in a really beautiful way and a timeless way so that something that he might have made five years ago is still relevant today and I think you can't ask anything more for a designer than that. Back to India. In spring 2023, French luxury fashion house Dior presented its fall collection here, right next to the famous Taj Mahal Palace Hotel in Mumbai, in front of the Gateway of India, one of the country's main landmarks. The French fashion house has enjoyed a long association with India and the renowned Mumbai-based Chanakya Atelier. They have been working together for many years. India's young, up-and-coming middle class, as well as a growing number of the super-rich, are becoming increasingly appealing to international fashion brands. The show was a deliberate sign from Dior's creative director, Maria Gracia Curie. She values the meticulous work of the atelier. It started with an archive that has coarse couching techniques. We have a collection of children's ceremonial jackets. It's probably from the Lucknow region within India, uh, and it uses the very typical couching technique. What we've done, it's, it's on a silk base. We wanted to find ways to keep it very, very fine, a thickness of thread that is almost just one millimeter. And if you look closer within the design, there's also a very fine orange thread. And the orange thread is really what is keeping together the whole embroidery. How is this rich tradition being passed on in India? And how is it taught? So it is in our blood. I mean, you cannot live in India and not be influenced by the textiles, the colors, the fabric, the cuts, the designs, the drapes. We are in India's capital, New Delhi, visiting the renowned National Institute of Fashion Technology, the NIFT Design School. It's the oldest and most prestigious of the 18 associated institutes nationwide. Those who have made it here have taken the first step into India's fashion industry. Currently, there are almost 1,300 students taking part in the Institute's various programs. Manisha Kinu heads the Institute in Delhi. It's important to her that the students not only realize their visions, but above all understand the rich heritage of Indian craftsmanship from the ground up. Each region of the subcontinent has its own unique crafts that need to be preserved. So our students grow learning all about design, fashion, silhouettes, but they also learn a lot about craft. So they go to the village in groups, sit in, on the floor with the craftsperson, learn what the craft is all about. So it works both ways. It's a very symbiotic kind of a thing because students learn about craft and craftsmen who've been doing the same thing for a long time, they get some ideas of the colors probably that they can use, diversification of products, which would also help in selling more products and increasing their livelihood. The problems of the fashion industry are also part of the curriculum. The textile industry ranks among the biggest environmental polluters. The concept of sustainability, waste-free production and upcycling are important parts of the training. For example, students learn how to dye with plants or cut fabric without waste. Technical innovations are becoming increasingly important. How to simplify and improve production, make it more efficient and environmentally friendly. The IT department is working on designing programs for 3D prints for sewing factories. Soon, every factory owner will be able to print out tools to upgrade their machines. 
This fabric defect detection machine works with AI. Its biggest advantage is that it's 95% more reliable than humans. No human intervention is required. And the way the fabric inspector works, that's a very hard working. They have to keep their eyes on the garment throughout the time that they should not miss any defects. So it's Im impacting their health also. And their working uh, hours are very short because they cannot work for the long. So it's helping to the industry in terms of the sustainability, the on the human aspect also, but also on the quality aspect also. But what about India's other fashion metropolis, Mumbai, a many faceted city? Magnificent old buildings in Victorian Gothic style. The metropolis of 12.5 million on the west coast is the biggest city in the country and one of the world's most populous. Like no other major Indian city, Mumbai stands for modernity and new beginnings. New Delhi is where the country's laws are made, but Mumbai is where its social trends are born. And the center of the Indian film industry, known as Bollywood, is also here. This is where we meet Priyanka Mishra, known in the scene as Pew. The stylist works with Indian film stars, dressing them for promotional events and publicity appearances, and styling them for the red carpet. <laughs> so I style Mr. Amir Khan, Shantanu Maheshwari, Milin Soman, Randeep Hoda. I've worked on projects where uh, it involved Kartik Aryan, Ayushman Khurana. I've also worked with women's. To name a few, Sushmita Sen, I've worked under teams which have styled Alia Bhatt and the list goes on. <laughs> when we are styling, we keep our eyes open as a stylist that what is going to be the trend and also when you see a celebrity, it's also aspirational. So our whole job is to keep them on trend, very fashionable and also aspirational and also make sure that something is on the table that has never been done. I specialize in menswear styling. So you'll see every actor that I style, the men is for sure wearing a jewelry, which again is a new thing because it was always believed that men's can't be ornamented and I, my men are always bejeweled head, head to toe. Pew takes us into the city to the young designers who stand out. With their style and attitude, they represent a new Indian self-confidence. Most of the workshops are hidden away in courtyards and small industrial areas. This, if you see, is very different from the process that you just saw. Wow. The entire wow. piece, so it's sewn thrice over. That's one technique that Mughals used to use to make ghagras. Mm -hmm. Designer Ativ Anand's credo is to create with respect for nature. His collections are produced as environmentally friendly as possible. For him, it's all about respectful recycling of materials and textiles. His fabrics are dyed naturally. Nature's full of surprises. This is green coconuts that are giving us pink color. You know, the hibiscus flower, which is red, gives you green color. Onion skins, which are purple, give you yellow color. Pomegranate skins, which are yellow, red, give you like a gray. I feel, for me, like the minute I've been exposed to this, it makes me, it humbles me. I realize that we don't know everything that we think we know. Like nature is so full of surprises that if we keep our curiosity open, there's so much for us to feel kind of connected. The team is super talented, like we can achieve any kind of color. We don't dictate colors. It doesn't come out of a shade card, it comes out from plants. So sometimes we'll realize that like the color that you get from fresh marigolds is very different than the color that you get from dried marigolds. It's just yellow, but it's a different shade of yellow. So when someone comes to us and says, oh, I want that particular shade, we say, okay, we'll try it but not sure that that's something we will achieve. We will, we will tell you how it unfolds and we'll show you the whole process and then you can pick from there. And I find that that is far more, how would I say, a gentler way to work with colors than say, oh no, I want that particular shade of pink. Bags full of marigold blossoms. Tons of them are used to decorate Hindu temple festivals and are later simply thrown away. But Anand gives them a new purpose. 
He uses them for dyeing. I feel like all of those flowers carry a lot of energy because people put all of that, of their manifestation of their energy into them when they offer them. And that actually translates into the clothes, so yeah. I, I enjoy working when we do with recycled cotton, is we, we introduce gold yeah. along with our recycled cotton yarns. With his haute couture wedding dress line, Re Ceremonial, the designer made it to the most important Indian fashion industry event in 2022, Lakme Fashion Week. For Atif Anand, his understanding of design and fashion is expressed in the name of his label, Re. That's how Re, because it echoed everything. It was not just recycling, it's also creating with respect. So re, you kind of resume older techniques, so re. So in that sense, it's a responsibility, so re. So in all of those senses, it felt like it kind of fit in as an ideology, and that's why I do what I do. Stylist Pew introduces us to another fashion designer. Surmai Jen studied at the NIFT Institute in Mumbai and in New York. In 2020, she founded her label Polite Society, polite in the sense of friendly. But with her label, Jen doesn't always want to be friendly. She wants to push boundaries. What is male? What is female? What are gender roles, predetermined norms and forms? One of her best sellers is the corset. The corsets, as part of history, have been um, a garment that's supposed to sort of restrain women. But it's so beautiful, right, at the same time, because it actually accentuates the, like, a woman's body in like a very particular way. And it's almost fascinating to see that this was something that was used to like restrain, you know, like, but uh, I wanted to like sort of take that and how can we use that to liberate now, you know. I'm not wearing this to look thinner or anything. It's sort of just hugging it in the right places. So we don't construct it in a way that it's going to be uncomfortable. Because comfort is also a big part of the clothing brand and uh, if you see like pockets everywhere, like my, f like it's completely adjustable, pockets so like really if pockets. I eat, I think we all over can agree I swear, that. and there is like lacing at the back, if I eat too much, I can just like loosen <laughs> it up a little bit. As far as Surmai Jen is concerned, her target group is 100% young Indians. She started her business right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Thanks to social media and online marketing, she and her team now make a good living. Stylist Pew shows us another brand, Tiesta, a shoe label. The makers of Tiesta are two sisters from Mumbai. They wanted to do something special in 2016, realize customers' wishes and dreams. Everything is made to measure for the most important event for Indian families, the wedding. It's a problem-solving company. It's not just a fa fast-selling fashion or something. We are actually helping people to get a perfect pair. Obviously, shoes, people, they have to be on their toes all day. <laughs> <laughs> Clothes you'll get everywhere. <laughs> it all started with high heels, custom-made with brocade embellishments and embroidery to match a wedding gown. Then one customer had a very special request, an embroidered wedding sneaker. I just flicked a picture from my phone, I uploaded on Instagram, and after that we've made like <laughs> around 500 of designs in that. And like we've shipped two to three thousand in these two years, just sneaker wedges. Just sneaker wedges. Just sneaker wedges. Word has spread about Tiesta's wedding sneakers. A newspaper from the Gulf states recently reported on the festive shoes. Tiesta gladly fulfills her customers' wishes, but also warns them. They asked us this one question saying that, uh, what do you suggest the brides when it comes to heels? Do they really need to wear heels? We have told them, you don't really need to match to your husband's height. It's okay, people know the difference. Just because if you want to like really look tall and everything, we understand. Don't go over the board. Four inches is what is tested and trial. If you want to go above that, think twice. Because four yeah, inches we is have uh, we have made ten inches <laughs> shoes for a client. I'm like eventually people know your height. <laughs> Stylist Pew also swears by Tiesta and even had a pair custom made, a daring six inches high, about fifteen centimeters. Everything is handmade, so they have their uh, tools with what they put it inside and then they stick it all up, so yeah. 
Tiesa's sneaker wedges cost between 8,000 and 12,000 Indian rupees. That's between 90 and 130 euros. To date, they have more than 10,000 customers and have even managed to get Bollywood stars to wear their shoes in photo shoots. Back to Delhi, India's second major fashion metropolis. We have an appointment in a fashion district in the middle of Delhi with the makers of the exclusive streetwear label Nor Black Nor White. The makers grew up in Toronto, Canada and returned to India in 2010 to explore Indian craftsmanship. And they stayed. Their specialty is a traditional tie-dye technique called bandani, which they reinterpret and combine with streetwear. They sell their creations online worldwide with a large fan base in the United States and among second-generation Indian migrants. We are both children of immigrants. Uh, grew up in areas of Toronto that were having other immigrant communities around us. We grew up with Sri Lankan, Guyanese, Trinidadian, Jamaican, Indian. Like we grew up with everybody and we got to learn about each other's culture. And again, as children of immigrants, we basically express, express and not children from everywhere, anywhere. You express yourself through your style. Their approach is colorful, bold, and handmade. Every piece takes time. Nor Black Nor White don't want to design a new collection each season. They want to produce slowly and consciously. They prefer pieces that last and can be worn for a long time. They've been selling online since 2010. Diversity in the industry has always been important to them, and not just since it became fashionable. I just feel like it's like that typical like fair skin, you know, we were told in our first, you know, photo shoot, we had, you know, shot one of our amazing friends for our first lookbook. And we were told that, who was from uh, Kerala, her family was from Kerala, based in Bombay, that, oh, you know, maybe you should use, like, a white model. You know what I mean? And it's like, no, well, that's not India. So for us, I think it's really important that we also show the people that wear our clothes. Nor black nor white fits in with the self-image of a young Indian generation that combines the traditional with the contemporary and doesn't see that as a contradiction. When I look at the, the industry in India now and just looking at our peers, the younger generation that's coming through, it's so exciting because they're really starting to form their own aesthetic that necessarily does not need to be your traditional wear. Like they are kind of dabbling in their street wear or they're like upcycling and there's a whole new era of designers coming out and I'm super stoked about it. Back in Paris, will Rahul Mishra convince the industry and the world press? The show proves a feast for the senses. Mishra's fall 2023 collection, We the People, is a success. The Indian celebrities who made the trip especially are also pleased. India is having a huge moment at the moment <laughs> uh, internationally. Um, everyone's talking about India, whether it's fashion, films, you know, the culture, uh, the food. I, j I just think that there's there's suddenly a keen interest in in India, which is great for us. Uh, you know, we're we're a culture and a country that's bursting with uh, diversity. So many different people from different places who speak different languages, who have different cultures, and just waiting to be explored by the rest of the world. So it's it's just perfect that you know finally the the world has woken up to us. Back in India, we drive to Noida, a satellite town on the outskirts of Delhi, for the last stage of our journey. It's around four months after the Paris show, and we wanted to see the conditions under which Mishra's visions are created. This is where he operates his dream factory. 
Around 200 employees embroider sequin after sequin as if in a trance, painstakingly applying millions of glittering stones onto the finest of fabrics. It's meticulous work. You are very excited about it. You wait for the, for, for, for the image to emerge. You wait for the embroidery source to get complete. You wait for the outfit to get three-dimensional shape. The designer stands by the idea behind his collection, We the People. He believes in fair payment for his employees, and he wants them to take pride in working for him. He even allows many of them to work and embroider from their home villages. When I look at the people I work with personally, they all really find this profession is going to be an enabler in terms of participation, how they can participate in creating a beautiful piece. But at the same time, it also enables them to, to be able to dream, to be able to fulfill their dream. Like uh, one of our uh, eldest embroiderer in, in our Rahul Mishra universe could send his daughter to study in UK. So when she is right now studying in London, this allows every embroiderer within the fraternity to, to dream that they can also do something like that for their uh, next generation. Improving the world with luxury goods, that's what Mishra believes in. He pays his employees double the standard wage for their sewing and embroidery work. Just before our interview, his social media posted this latest coup. U.S. singer and actress Selena Gomez glowing in a Rahul Mishra floral dress. Celebrities are door openers in the haute couture business. In Mumbai in April 2023, we found out what can happen when a Hollywood star wears a Rahul Mishra creation. U.S. actress Zendaya wore a delicate starry sky sari by Mishra to the grand opening of a cultural temple in Mumbai. The images went around the world and the sari became a sought-after fashion piece. A triumph for Rahul Mishra. The custom-made piece involved around 3,000 hours of handwork and cost over 12,000 euros. For his dedication to ethical and sustainable fashion, he has also been honored by the French government with the Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres Award. He's even met French President Emmanuel Macron. I was feeling, uh, you know, there could have been more Indians over there at the dinner. So I was the only one, uh, you know, resident from India at President Macron's dinner. I really feel, uh, you know, this thing should change really fast because India is the most populous country. Uh, for these kind of events also, we should get like, you know, far bigger representation from the country. The designer now hopes to attract attention worldwide with an easy-to-wear line. He launched it together with one of India's largest retail groups as a sponsor. But the line is still intended to be produced slowly and consciously with lots of handmade items. Rahul Mishra remains true to his principles. Fashion in India. As diverse, promising and dazzling as the subcontinent itself. By 2030, the world's most populous country could be one of the top three economies in the world. India's middle class is growing. The era of Western aesthetics, long dictated by the British, is over. We're not running behind the fashion trends that West world had to offer. I could take some things from Indian traditions from add my own sensibility to it and also create something which was completely contemporary. So a lot of us are undoing a lot of learning. There are these colonized ideas of beauty that we all have that we're sort of letting go of a little bit. There's curiosity in the world that hasn't been there before. We have so much talent in India. There is, there is so much to explore. I'm sure there are going to be many Indian designers who are going to feel really inspired about it and they all are going to join me also in creating beautiful India story uh, on the global fashion map. <laughs>